Thank you for tuning into today's video. If you're a true crime enthusiast, welcome aboard. We release new content three times a week. If you haven't subscribed yet, please consider liking this video as it greatly supports our channel. Don't forget to subscribe with notifications turned on to stay updated on all our future posts. Ever since he was a child, Mark Twitchell had dreamed of becoming a big-time Hollywood filmmaker. However, he knew the odds were against him as he lived in Edmonton, Canada, which wasn't known for being a movie-making hub. Despite this, after high school, he enrolled in an art college in Edmonton. In 2000, he graduated, earning his degree in radio and television art. Yet, after college, despite making several films utilizing his training, None of them gained any traction beyond his friends and family, and it seemed like his filmmaking career was hitting a dead end. However, in 2007, Mark had an unintentional breakthrough. Being a long-time Star Wars fanatic that year, he decided, purely as a passion project, to write a script for a prequel to the Star Wars franchise. Upon sharing the script with some of his colleagues, they were so impressed with his writing that they exclaimed, Mark, you need to produce this into a movie. This is incredible. Astonished by the overwhelming feedback, Mark decided, you know what, I'll produce this movie. He began sending his script to various actors and actresses to gauge their interest in participating. Surprisingly, one of the original Star Wars actors, Jeremy Bullock, who played Boba Fett, read the script and was so impressed that he agreed to play a role in Mark's film. Thus, this passion project quickly transformed into Mark's most significant success to date, while the movie did well, it didn't launch Mark into Hollywood stardom. However, it did establish him as a bona fide filmmaker and taught him that focusing on subjects he was truly passionate about increased the likelihood of success. In 2008, about a year after creating the Star Wars fan fiction film, Mark decided to undertake another film project centered around another passion of his, Dexter. Dexter was a highly popular TV show about a fictional serial killer named Dexter. Dexter's modus operandi was luring victims into small rooms, which he called kill rooms, entirely lined with plastic sheeting on the ceiling, walls and floor to contain the blood. He would then kill his victims, often using a knife, dismember them, bag up their remains, roll up the plastic and dispose of both the evidence and the body in the ocean. Mark's obsession with the show inspired him to base his next movie on a real-life killer, departing from the fictional realm of Dexter. Coincidentally, around the time he contemplated this movie, an elusive murderer was causing terror in Edmonton. Mark decided that the Edmonton killer would be the central figure in his film. For the following weeks, Mark immersed himself in exhaustive research on the Edmonton killer and his victims, meticulously constructing a comprehensive timeline of the events. Once he felt he had gathered every conceivable detail, he used the information to craft a 42-page first draft of his script. However, shortly after the completion of the first draft, it somehow got leaked. The script's contents were so shocking and controversial that it found its way into the hands of the Edmonton police. After reading the script, the authorities immediately realized the gravity of the situation. They reached out to Mark, emphatically instructing him, under no circumstances can you turn this script into a movie. Subsequently, the police took measures to ensure the script's disappearance. Presently, only heavily censored versions of Mark's script are accessible online. However, I recently acquired an uncensored version of this 42-page script. While I won't read it verbatim, I'll utilize the script's information to recount Mark's highly contentious Edmonton killer story. As you listen, please remember that this story is grounded in real events and the victims' names and details are factual. Here we go. In early October 2008, Giles Tetro, a soft-spoken 26-year-old casino security guard living alone in Edmonton, found his life in disarray. His wife had recently confessed that she no longer loved him and was planning to leave. Still deeply attached to his wife, Giles was devastated. Attempting to distract himself, Giles often found himself overwhelmed by loneliness and sorrow. However, on the afternoon of Friday, October 3rd, upon returning home from work, 
he made a decision. I need to get my life together, starting with finding a new romantic partner. He created a profile on a dating site and began scrolling through the profiles of women in his vicinity. Initially, no one caught his interest, but then he came across the profile of Sheena, a young, beautiful, blonde woman residing in Edmonton. Giles thought, why not? I'll send her a message, introducing himself and expressing his desire to connect further. Sheena replied within a couple of minutes, and over the next few hours, the two exchanged dozens of messages, getting to know each other better. Eventually, Sheena suggested to Giles, why don't we meet tonight, grab dinner, and watch a movie together, considering we live so close. Excited, Giles agreed, sure, I'll come pick you up, what's your address? Sheena hesitated. I don't feel comfortable sharing my address on this dating website. Instead, she provided Giles with a peculiar set of directions that led to a series of recognizable landmarks in Edmonton without revealing her actual address. She also instructed him that upon arrival, he should find a detached garage with an open door. From there, he should navigate through the garage, reach the backyard, and proceed to the back door of her house where she would meet him. Though Giles found this a bit unusual, he understood Sheena's cautious approach given their recent acquaintance. He assured her that he had no problem following her unique directions and set out to meet her. After quickly freshening up, dressing and driving to Sheena's house, Giles found himself in an alleyway in a suburban neighborhood, following the directions she had provided. Spotting a two-car garage with the door slightly ajar, he recognized it as Sheena's. Giles maneuvered his way into the garage, guided by the dim light filtering through the open door. Despite the darkness, he could discern that the garage was mostly empty, except for the walls, ceiling, and floor covered in plastic sheeting. Ignoring the oddity, he proceeded toward the door leading to Sheena's backyard. As he reached for the door handle, a sudden searing pain shot through the back of his neck. Startled, he turned around, only to confront a massive figure clad in a black and gold hockey mask, wielding a stun baton. Attempting to escape, Giles dashed past the assailant, but the man managed to strike him in the stomach with the stun baton, causing him to crumple in excruciating agony, struggling to regain his footing in the dark garage. As Giles turned, he froze, realizing the masked man stood between him and the open garage door, now brandishing a gun directly at him. Gripped by fear, Giles obeyed the assailant's demand to lie down on the plastic sheeting, knowing he was utterly defenseless. The attacker proceeded to cover Giles' eyes with a piece of duct tape, leaving him paralyzed with terror, contemplating the possibility of never seeing his loved ones again. Lying there blind and afraid, Giles grasped the reality that he hadn't informed anyone of his whereabouts. If this maniac were to end his life, who would discover his body? Would his family and friends ever learn what had transpired? The sounds of chains or handcuffs being manipulated amplified Giles' dread. Determined not to be shackled and meet his demise in this dire circumstance, Giles summoned his last ounce of courage, tearing off the tape, and confronted his attacker, declaring his refusal to go down without a fight. To his surprise, the attacker raised the gun, only for Giles to quickly discern that it was a plastic fake. Encouraged by this revelation, he grappled with the assailant, attempting to strike back, but the man's superior strength swiftly subdued him. Giles was head-butted, crashing to the ground, as the attacker launched a relentless assault. Despite the barrage of blows, Giles, fueled by adrenaline, felt no pain, focusing on finding a way to stand and escape the garage. Managing to break free from the assailant's grasp, he dashed towards the garage door. However, as he made a desperate attempt to flee, the attacker seized his jacket, prompting Giles to swiftly twist and slip out of it, rolling out of the garage. Outside, drained of strength by the stun baton, Giles struggled to rise, yet the attacker lunged, grabbing his ankle from beneath the garage, attempting to drag him back inside. After a fierce struggle, Giles eventually broke free, summoning another surge of adrenaline as he fled down the alleyway, bypassing his car. Collapsing a few houses away, he hoped for aid at the bustling intersection. Spotting his masked assailant approaching, Giles was too exhausted to stand. Luckily, a passing couple responded to his cries for help. Standing in front of Giles, he pointed towards the oncoming attacker, 
explaining that the man was attempting to kill him. Remarkably, the attacker strolled over casually, addressing Giles as Frank, insisting it was all a game and that he should return to the garage. Bewildered, the couple chose to leave, leaving Giles alone in the center of the intersection. Observing the assailant pacing back and forth in the partially open garage, confused and unsure of his next move, Giles focused on reaching his truck and escaping, traumatized by the harrowing experience. Despite feeling embarrassed and ashamed of being deceived by the person he believed was Sheena, he chose to keep the incident to himself, refraining from reporting it to the authorities or confiding in his friends and family. A week later, on October 8th, Johnny Altinger, a 38-year-old Edmonton man, was exploring the same dating website Giles had used. Although Johnny worked in quality control for an oil and gas company, he found little joy in his job, preferring to spend his time tinkering with computers or his beloved motorcycle. Despite having close friends, romance had always eluded him. That afternoon, like Giles, Johnny was perusing the dating website in search of a potential partner. Browsing through various profiles, none caught his attention until he stumbled upon the profile of Jen, a beautiful blonde residing in Edmonton. After exchanging messages, they quickly arranged to meet for dinner and a movie that night. However, when Johnny requested her address, Jen hesitated, expressing her reluctance to disclose her location on the website due to her paranoia. Instead, she provided a set of unusual directions, guiding him to her residence through familiar landmarks in Edmonton. She instructed him to enter through the open garage, make his way through the back door, and meet her at the back entrance. Despite finding the directions peculiar, Johnny brushed off any concerns and forwarded the email to one of his close friends, jokingly mentioning that this was where he would be if he went missing. After preparing himself, he set out, following the directions that led him to the same two-car garage in the same alleyway Giles had visited a week earlier. Arriving at the garage with one door partially open and lights still on inside, he realized he had arrived ahead of schedule by 15 to 20 minutes. Parking his car, he contemplated whether Jen might already be inside. Assuming she wouldn't mind, he approached the partially open garage door. However, as he drew closer, the lights abruptly went out, leaving him puzzled. Despite his reservations, he continued toward the garage door, peering inside. In the illuminated space, Johnny noticed the garage was devoid of its usual contents, entirely covered in plastic sheeting, with a solitary table placed to the side. To his surprise, Jen was nowhere to be found. Instead, he encountered an unfamiliar man, who introduced himself as Harry, claiming to be a designer renting the garage from Jen. Harry informed Johnny that Jen was running late and would return in approximately 20 minutes. He suggested that Johnny return and directed him to come back to the garage, where he would be escorted to the house. Baffled by the encounter, Johnny pondered Jen's connection with the mysterious designer and the bizarrely covered garage. Nonetheless, he decided to abide by the request and wait for Jen to arrive. Johnny agreed to return in 20 minutes, heading back to his car and driving around for the designated time. Upon his return to the garage, he noticed the light inside had now turned off, indicating Harry's departure. Relieved at the thought of avoiding any interaction with the peculiar man, Johnny decided to proceed. He parked his car, exited and made his way to the garage. As he entered the dark space and moved across the plastic-covered floor toward the door leading to Jen's backyard, he suddenly felt a powerful impact at the back of his head. Dazed, Johnny instinctively raised his hands to shield himself, only to find Harry, the man he had encountered earlier, standing in the shadows, wielding a large metal pipe. Terrified, Johnny began to scream for help, but Harry relentlessly struck him with the pipe, preventing any chance of escape. Despite the brutal assault, Johnny remained conscious, desperately trying to shield himself from the blows. As Johnny pleaded for mercy, offering money and anything to secure his release, Harry brandished a hunting knife, holding it menacingly in front of Johnny's face. In a moment of panic, Johnny grasped the pipe to thwart Harry's attack. Unperturbed, Harry retrieved the knife and with a swift motion stabbed Johnny in the stomach, causing excruciating pain and distress. With Johnny's screams piercing the air, Harry withdrew the knife, only to drive it into the side of Johnny's neck. Helpless and bleeding, 
Johnny succumbed to his injuries, gasping for aid in his final moments. Regret momentarily washed over Harry as he lamented not prolonging Johnny's torment before ending his life. Disposing of the evidence, Harry dismembered Johnny's body and wrapped it in plastic, along with the remnants lining the garage. Days later, he disposed of the evidence and body parts down a nearby sewer drain. The story abruptly concluded with Mark's script, leaving Harry's subsequent actions undisclosed. However, the police intervened, preventing Mark from turning the script into a movie. They had already identified the owner of the garage, where both Giles and Johnny had been attacked. Johnny's friend, to whom he had forwarded Jen's email containing the strange directions, had provided this critical information to the authorities. Johnny had been reported missing, prompting the police to follow the unusual directions to the garage. Upon investigation, they discovered the garage did not belong to a young woman named Jen or Sheena, nor to a designer named Harry. Rather, it was owned by a burgeoning filmmaker named Mark Twitchell. Mark had been cooperative with the police and allowed them to search the garage, finding no evidence. However, a hidden document on Mark's laptop revealed a 42-page script. In this script, the police stumbled upon a shocking revelation. It detailed the events of Giles, the first victim of the Edmonton killer. Despite Giles confiding only in the Edmonton police, every detail of his ordeal was eerily accurate in Mark's script. The realization dawned that Mark was the Edmonton killer. Mark's motivations were chillingly clear. Driven by a desperate desire to create a killer in his movie as compelling as Dexter from the television show, Mark opted to embody the role himself. He sought to experience the act of luring unsuspecting victims into a kill room to authentically depict it in his script. He believed this authenticity would propel his movie to unparalleled heights, securing his ticket to Hollywood. After luring and attacking Giles using a fake dating profile, Mark incorporated the experience into his script. The successful capture and murder of Johnny followed, with Mark meticulously chronicling the account and appending it to the narrative of Giles's attack. Mark was essentially living out his movie script in real time, titled SK Confessions, Serial Killer Confessions. The script served as a tangible confession. However, the abrupt ending suggested Mark's plans for further killings intended to be incorporated into the script. The script ultimately played a crucial role in Mark's conviction for murder, leading to his current incarceration, serving a life sentence. Hey friends, if you found today's stories interesting, please subscribe to our channel and enable notifications, ensuring you never miss our weekly uploads. Your support is invaluable as we bring you new stories every week. Until next time.